What does it all mean? This is where the archaeology has been found. Oh, hi, how are you? Oh, look at that. I, I need a, a planter. A shrine to a belly button. This is a rock of salt? Look at that. No one gets into this place. No one. Let's, whoa, don't take me too far. Now that's naked archaeology. I'm on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and I'm interested in Bethsaida, which is on the other side of this lake. And I'm particularly interested in a cross that they found just across this lake. And now, why am I so interested? Because it's earlier than anybody believes a cross was a Christian symbol. It may upset everyone's understanding of early Christianity. Now, I can do a lot of things, but walking on water is not one of them. So I'll get across another way. But according to the Gospels, that miracle of Jesus took place right here. So maybe this is the water he walked on to take a shortcut to Bethsaida, a name you probably don't know. If you haven't heard about it, you'll hear about it now. It's one of the towns mentioned in the Gospels as a hangout for Jesus and his movement. Five, count them, five of the 12 disciples were in diapers right over here. This is where they were born. And very close by, within a few feet, a few meters, they found a cross. Yes, they found a cross and nobody celebrated. Why? Because it wasn't where everyone expected it to be. What's it doing here dated to the time of Jesus? The cross was not always the symbol of Christianity. When the Roman government crucified Jesus in the first century, they also intended to kill his movement. Since many of his early followers were fishermen, fish symbols became their secret handshake when the religion was outlawed. According to scholars, the first followers of Jesus wouldn't have used the cross, an image of the crucifixion, as the symbol of their movement. Why not? This is Mark Appalt, whose specialty is the New Testament. So let's ask him. It's considered a terrible instrument of death. The cross has become sanitized in modern Christianity. But in ancient times, it was the instrument of brutality and horror and death. So that's the argument that it couldn't have been an early Christian symbol. Yeah. So what we've been told is that you never see the cross as a symbol for Christianity before the fourth century. According to scholars, the credit for making the cross Christianity's iconic symbol goes to this guy the Roman Emperor Constantine. In the year 312, Constantine is sleeping before a big battle when he gets a vision of the cross in the sky, a premonition that he will win if he puts the cross on the shields of his soldiers. He does, he wins the battle, he later converts to Christianity and declares that what was an outlawed religion is now the legal religion favored by the emperor. Well, I'll be a uncle. From then on, you see crosses everywhere. But where was Constantine coming from? Before his conversion, Constantine is a sun worshiper, a follower of Saul Invictus, which means unconquered sun. Why unconquered? Because the sun seems to be conquered by night, only to be resurrected every morning. After Constantine, the cross becomes very important because it is the symbol of crucifixion. Jesus' death and resurrection becomes the central message of Christianity. Instead of worshiping the resurrected son, Romans started worshiping the resurrected son. According to this view, before Constantine, Christians would never have used the image of the cross as their symbol. But what if scholars are wrong? What if early Christians did use the cross, but it meant something different to them than it means to us? After all, if the cross wasn't already a Christian symbol, why did Constantine associate it with Christianity? But I've been down this road before, and every time I see an early cross, scholars deny it's a cross. This is museum curator 
David Mevorach, and we have differing opinions regarding the etchings carved into these first century ossuaries, or bone boxes, essentially limestone coffins. This is a cross. No, it's not a cross. It's a flower or a rosette, but poorly executed. My reason tells me when I see a flower that it's a flower, not a poorly executed tree. If I see a fish, I don't think it's a poorly executed no, yeah. hippopotamus. One sec. I look over there, yeah. okay? And that looks to me like a cross. If you want to go into serious research, I'm all for it. Take all the data, all the data is there. Lay it in front of you, write an article. Why does it have to be in a paper? Why can't it be in a film? It can be oh. in a film, but uh, it, has, it has to be done seriously. So that's why I have to ask and myself. I'm trying to prove here that the cross was adopted by the Christians 400 years before it was. That's exactly what I suspect. So let's head back to Beth Saida and meet professors of archaeology and biblical studies, Richard Freund and Rami Arav, whose team has discovered a first century cross. And you've got the goods. So can, can I see it? This image of a cross is not only archaeologically dated to the time of Jesus, it's the oldest cross ever found, period. And the problem is when you, f the level at which you found right. it. Everybody thought initially, first century cross doesn't make any sense at Bethsaida. And first century cross in general is certainly not a symbol of Christianity. But are you saying that they adopted this symbol? Absolutely. They adopted this symbol as a representation of what was meaningful to them. If this was the place where the apostles met for the first time, every single symbol on every single piece of pottery is meaningful. If this is the place. So let's find out if it is, because if this place matches up with the Gospels, then what we're holding in our hands could be the key to unlocking the early Jesus movement. Jesus told Back in the fourth century, the Roman Emperor Constantine changes Christianity from an outlawed sect to a legal religion. According to scholars, you can thank him for inventing the cross as a Christian symbol. That's the story we've been told. But now that a first century cross has been found in Bethsaida in the Galilee, right where Jesus and the disciples hung out, we'll find out the real story. We're here with archaeologist Rami Arav, who tells us that Bethsaida is the only place in the Holy Land where you can actually walk in the footsteps of Jesus. This is the one and only street on the entire sites of Israel where you can look at it and say Jesus walked on this very street, something that you cannot say anywhere else the in the country. The actual stones. Yeah, because if you go to Jerusalem, it's all medieval. You go to Capernaum, it's all Byzantine and later. Unlike the other towns mentioned in the Gospels, only Bethsaida has remained as it was in the first century. So if the Gospels are correct, Jesus walked on the stones I'm walking on now. But does the archaeology here match the story in the Gospels? Since Jesus and the Apostles were Jewish, what would you expect to find? People have always asked me, where is the synagogue at Bethsaida? And I always tell them, you're looking at the synagogue. The courtyard houses, just like house churches, there were house synagogues. That was the beginning of synagogues. This is the way the church began. This is the way I think the synagogue began in the land of Israel. Richard is talking about this house. But how do they know it was a synagogue? Anybody home? Nobody's Nobody here. You go. Thank you. Look at this place. It's a huge house for the time and for this area. And it's this huge courtyard that Richard must be talking about. They must have prayed and they must have gathered as they would have in any house synagogue. That was their background. What's a house synagogue? You'd meet in someone's home. This fits that description perfectly. You've got this courtyard, open courtyard. What a wonderful place to gather for prayer. Because not everyone has a house big enough for no. people to gather. 
sounds good, but if you want me to believe that this is a place where Jews were praying, I would expect to see the remains of a large kitchen, or at least some evidence of catering. This is the kitchen here. <clears throat> oh, you know how I know this is the kitchen? How's that? Because it says kitchen. Oh, there you go. And this kitchen is so big, it has not one, but two ovens. This house is too large for a family, but it's the perfect size for a movement. And we know that one of the earliest practices of the Christian movement was the communal meal. From early on, one of the big things for the Jesus movement was the communal meal. The communal meal. And this is what it's all about. You're going to stay at a separate table, this religion is going to get nowhere. Right. Here, they had room for it. Yeah, communion. It would be a gathering. We know from the Gospels that five of the disciples of Jesus came from this town. We also know that Jesus spent time here. Is it possible that Christianity began in this very house? But if you think that's far-fetched, I've got news for you. It's in this house right here that they found the cross. And when you add up the evidence, this house perfectly fits the bill for the movement that would later be called Christianity. But if you're still not convinced there's something else here that you don't usually find in your run-of-the-mill fisherman's village. In here, we discovered four intact large wine jars. And did you find the remains of wine inside the... Uh... The jars? There's, there's residue on the inside of the jar that helped us identify them as wine jars. Now, could you tell whether that wine had previously been water? I'm going into the wine cellar of the earliest house church on the planet. Wow! The Gospels tell us that bread and wine were essential rituals of the communal meal. So if this house was where Jesus and the disciples had their first communal meals, this wine cellar makes perfect sense. Huge. They're either winos or they're accommodating a movement. Why would you have a wine cellar in a fisherman's village? They didn't have wine tastings back then. Oh, I like this Merlot. What year is it? Four. No. The discovery of this large house and wine cellar is a clue that this is a gathering place for people to pray together, eat together, and bless the wine. And if the cross, the kitchen, the courtyard, and the wine cellar add up to the start of Christianity, what about archaeological proof of the profession of fishing? After all, nearly half of the apostles were fishermen. So what would really close the case that this is where Christianity began is evidence of fishing. And you know what? Right next door to this house, archaeologists found a fisherman's house. And how do you know it's a fisherman's house? Because of the uh, abundance of fishing implements, everything that you would expect a fisherman to have in his home. The name Bethsaida is made up of two Aramaic words, Beth, meaning house, and Saida meaning fishing. And in this house, they found dozens of fishing-related objects. They store and catalog all their finds in this warehouse. Do I believe this is the fisherman's house? I buy it hook, line, and sinker. And interestingly, there are quite a few rooms here. It's not just for one fisherman. You find this right next to, it looks like a barracks, like. Right, it's a, court, a huge courtyard house, the with, largest fisherman's house with rooms all around the outside. It looks like the guy is running a huge enterprise. Well, it's a, it's a manor house. We would call it a manor house today. So I don't know about you, but I'm convinced that this is where the Jesus movement began, which makes this cross of supreme importance. No one is going to mistake this for a poorly executed flower. But clearly, there is no image of crucifixion here. So what was its meaning for the early followers of Jesus? I've got a theory. I'm in Bethsaida, where Jesus gathered his followers 2,000 years ago. And what's happened here lately? Plenty. A 
21st century cross has just been found ruffling the feathers of everyone who believes that the cross only became a symbol for Christianity in the 4th century, after Constantine. But if this is a cross, since it was found in a 1st century house of prayer, then it literally marks the spot where Christianity was born. As we've seen, most scholars deny that the cross was identified with Christianity before the 4th century. So I'm off to Rome to find more evidence of pre-Constantine Christian crosses. In the Palatine Antiquarian Museum in Rome, there is a Roman graffiti which mocks the beliefs of the early Christians. In this crude joke, we can clearly see that a hundred years before Constantine, the cross and Jesus on the cross is already a Christian symbol. Darius Aria is an archaeologist in Rome, and he's going to explain the ancient graffiti to us. So this dates to the first half of the third century AD. This is extremely old, and essentially what it is is a man on a crucifix, but this man has the head of an ass. The inscription beneath says that Alexamenos, so this is a Greek person, is worshiping his god. So it seems to be then someone making fun of this Alexamenos person who is a Christian who is worshiping, of all things, a god who is crucified, who is killed. People are taking notice of this new religion, taking notice of these people that are worshiping a new kind of god, a god that's crucified, and then ultimately making fun of it and getting a laugh. So if someone's making fun of Jesus on the cross in the third century, that means the cross has already been a Christian symbol for a while. Once we realize that the cross as a Christian symbol predates Constantine, this gives new meaning to all the crosses that we see on these first century ossuaries, which are in the warehouse of the Israel Antiquities Authority just outside of Jerusalem. But if scholars are right, and the first century is too close to Jesus' suffering for his followers to identify with the cross, why did they adopt it as their symbol? Well, in ancient Hebrew, the shape of the last letter of the alphabet, called the Tau, is, guess what? In the shape of a cross. And in the Bible it says, set a Tau upon the foreheads of the men who cry because of all the abominations. In other words, the cross was the sign of righteousness for centuries before Jesus. God says to Ezekiel, put the sign of the last letter of the Hebrew, right. the, the tau, tau right. which is an X. Right, which was an X in that period. Put it on the forehead of the righteous. Right. Meaning it's already a symbol of righteousness. In fact, Tertullian, the, the, the church father. Church father. father mocks the early Jesus movement, the so-called Ebionites. Right. He says, these guys, they pray all day and they make the sign of the towel on their foreheads so much, right. so often, they're gonna have scars there. So since the cross was a symbol of righteousness prior to Jesus, it shouldn't surprise us to find it in the house where he may have prayed. But what did the circle mean for the people who knew Jesus? I think the answer to this question holds within it the secret origins of Christianity. I'm in Bethsaida, in the Galilee, where a cross has just been discovered exactly from the time and place where Jesus was gathering his disciples. I think it could help us to understand the early Jesus movement once we know why that movement started here and what this cross meant to his disciples. Five of his disciples come from five of the 12 from right where you're sitting, from right, right. here from Bethsaida. And it wasn't... What does that say, though, well, about his movement, his ideology? Bethsaida was clearly a mixed population. We mixed do, what, what, what? Mixed what? population, Jewish and clearly non-Jewish population. We can find ethnic markers like from their pottery, markings on oil lamps that we find here are clearly, clearly Jewish. But we also find 
pagan ethnic markers. So we know that there are non-Jews and Jews living together in this area of, of Bethsaida in some kind of a community where they were obviously working together for the, the industry of fishing. So maybe Jesus is not bucking that. Maybe he's actually... Building on that. Building on it. Right. Remember the pagan Roman god Sol Invictus, the unconquered sun? This image of the sun with emanating rays shows up later in countless depictions of Jesus. The Bethsaida cross looks like the Sol Invictus image that Gentiles at the time would have worshipped and that everyone in Bethsaida would have known. As we have seen, the Emperor Constantine is credited with combining the sun with the sun. But here it is, Sol Invictus imagery fused with the Jewish Tao 300 years before Constantine. What I have in my hand now that you guys have dug up is actually as close as you can get to the moment that they're fusing and becoming a symbol of this new movement that's surrounding Jesus. It was a, a movement that may have encompassed many people who were not Jewish. From day one. From day one. That's mm -hmm. a big wow. <laughs> Here in Bethsaida, aren't we looking at really ground zero in a sense of Christianity? Well, if, if you want to look and compare it with anything else that's been found, this is the closest thing we have to ground zero. So it seems that the Bethsaida cross has been decoded, and it's a symbol that could only have been born in this particular Galilean village. If X marks the spot, then this is the most important site of Christianity, the original Vatican, where the First Supper, not the Last Supper, took place. Jesus, oh.